So this is a, just a brief introduction um, called Death of the Marbleau Man and why it gives me hope for the web. So I don't know if uh, you remember times, I don't know what it was like in Poland, but decades ago when smoking was absolutely everywhere, people would smoke in offices, in airports, in schools even. Smoking was a huge pervasive practice um, that was just part of everyday life. And if you didn't agree with smoking, you couldn't do much about it. It seemed like this was part of the culture, it was part of the ecosystem, this was just the way things were. And the industries that were behind tobacco seemed so powerful and so entrenched that people didn't know what to do about it. So it wasn't easy for health advocates, for people who wanted cleaner, safer, healthier environments, it wasn't easy to get together and try to make this big ecosystem change. But they did. And I think there's a lot to learn from this for our own ecosystems. So to change tobacco and to, change, to get towards smoke-free environments, there were at least three but more um, tactics in play. One was around consumer education. So there was a, for, a effort to change the textbooks, to change what was taught in schools, to change what everyday people thought about tobacco, and to realize that it was unhealthy. There was also advocacy. So laws were changed, there was um, lobbying and policy makers really forcing um, at a level, at a legal level, for better, healthier environments. And then lastly, there was all sorts of pressure, consumer pressure, like choices made by individual consumers that affected the industry, so that industries felt the choices of the consumers and had to adapt. And so through those things, consumer education, advocacy, and direct pressure on industry, we actually have a pretty healthy no sense of no smoking environments here today. So that's just a glimmer of hope from the past. Um, but I think we, today we have different battles, of course. The one I want to talk about, which I think has um, relations to Creative Commons and to sharing, is about personal data. So these are just some headlines from the top data breaches and abuses uh, on the internet in the last year. You know, you have AT&T uh, in collaboration with the NSA, you have the dating site Ashley Madison um, getting hacked. All we see across the board, um, plenty and plenty of stories about how our data is being abused. And this is abuse not just done by governments, but it's also done by corporations. And I just want to take a few moments in the, in the introduction to talk about the corporate surveillance because I think this is an ecosystem that actually we can change and we can do this together as advocates for open ecosystems. So corporate surveillance basically comes down to advertisements. Um, advertisements used to be simple. You used to have a newspaper that had a little square of content and um, advertisers could buy a square of content in a newspaper or on TV and put their products there. And it was very clear when there was content and when, when there was you know, curated content and when there was an ad. And there was a bit of a social contract between the viewer and the ad, which said, if I look at this ad, I will acknowledge that I've looked at it, but that's pretty much, and I may go on to buy your product, I may not, but that's my decision. And it was kind of a simple contract. But the web came. And advertisers started to say, oh, the web is really great. We are able to see where people click on things. We can see if they look at our ads. You know, we start to get more sophisticated in how people are actually viewing the things that we pay for. So advertisers invested a ton of money in online advertising. And because there was a ton of money there, they also started to have fraud robots. <laughs> so robots started to click on things and pretend to be human, because if you pretend to be human, you can actually get a lot of money. So robots would like hover around pages, pretend to open pages, and do all sorts of behavior that made it look like they were human. And the advertisers said, oh no, we're losing our money. These are robots looking at our ads, not humans. So they started to do all sorts of really terrible things for our personal privacy, including trackers. So trackers are, quite uh, malicious at times. It can be simple and powerful, but 
what happens is the advertiser start to say, it's not good enough that we just know that you opened a web page, but now we want to follow you across the web to really sure you're doing human-like activity. And then they started to team up with other advertisers. They realized if they built these networks and shared our personal data with each other, they could even be more effective in determining our humanness. So basically the advertisement agency are trying to fight the robots. They are investing tons of money. They're still not winning in having their money be better spent. But what happens in the end is that we as individuals are really bearing the, the burden of this, of this corporate surveillance and our privacy is being uh, eroded. But this is an optimistic and celebratory event. Um, so I wanted to share why I think change is possible. Um, this is just one particular issue around the health of the web and of the commons, but I wanted to share it with you today because I think it's important. And because I think there's things that we can learn about the success from Creative Commons. So I think Creative Commons, and a huge shout out to Creative Commons Poland for the last 10 years, really being effective on this front. I think took these three components of positive ecosystem change, consumer education, advocacy, and pressure on industries to actually change the ecosystem here. And so all through today, you've heard examples about how this is happening in education, in science, you know, music, culture, software, et cetera. And I think this is a huge shout out to the Creative Commons community and all the allies here, that they have used these techniques over the last decade to make a more healthy ecosystem for sharing and innovation and education. So yes, I think we can work together and continue to, to use these different techniques to improve ecosystems. Um, at Mozilla, we tried to do this as well with the browser Firefox to have pressure on industry by creating a product that for furthers our values. Um, we also do consumer education, so we use um, a network of volunteers and educational institutions to teach digital skills, to teach open practices, to teach about sharing and web literacy. And we also do advocacy campaigns like fighting for net neutrality, fighting for better privacy online and, and other causes. And so this is really just a banner, which I would be curious to hear if it resonates with you, that everyone should be able to read, write, and participate online. And this is part about, this is important to being fully human and active in our society today. So I think that's a goal that we can share together, um, the Mozilla communities, Creative Commons communities, people who really care about the value of reading, writing, and participating, and the value of having healthy ecosystems online. This was the CC Summit in Warsaw in 2013. So many faces who are contributing to these healthy ecosystems everywhere. So I just wanted to say a congratulations and to another 10 or more years fighting for healthy ecosystems together.